walk into his store and you see all those fabulous photographs on the wall and those beautiful models in the photographs. Great celebrities on the wall wearing clothing. You feel part of a special club. And uh, you know, you, you, wanna, you wanna wear a bond. You wanna be like, I'm, I'm a bond lady. I came here as a kid, so this is home. I, this is what I know. I'm a New York kid, you, you know. This is what I know. This is all I know. Holly Springs, Mississippi. Yeah, well, my, my okay, friend me, loves to come to Bonds. We, I love to come to New York. And she loves to come to Bonds. So, you know, we always make a trip here. So she has a few hats. She has a few hats by Bonds. This is a, my girlfriend who is from here. She, her, she and her husband come all the time. I think in uh, 2005 I bought four, 2006 I bought four, and now I'm buying three. So what is that? That's eight plus three, that's 11 hats. No, 12. I'm shipping one to you. 12. 12. I've ordered one. I still thought a school that I could win. I came last in every class that I went to. Last. Dead. Spelling, I couldn't spell. I loved art. Physical education. I was a fairly decent soccer player. That was my bounce. They have one dimensional teachers. They have one format to teach every child. I started hanging out with this old boy, and he was doing shoemaking. So I went a little trade with him. A shoemaker, I, I, that was my first trade. I mean, I used to hold sole shoes and make sandals and do my little thing. Brought in Broom Street down there years ago. And then he used to do some work in his house, in his basement. He was in the 70s. That was my introduction. Then I started working with him. He got a little place down on Broadway and Third Street there on the sidewalk. Um, we should go Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He's sewing and little block here. You know, we had a nice little thing going there. Then, you know, he was a serious and so yeah. Then I started sewing with a woman named Patricia Underwood. And I worked there for a while. So run her shop, basically. I had a guy who used to sit work for me. He's, I had a couple of tables all day on Lennox on 125th. And uh, she saw an ad one morning in a write up they had in New York Newsday. She called me and she said, Bon, this is you? I said, Yeah. She said, Well, you doing your own work? I said, Well, yeah. Well, you know you can't do your work and my work, and so why not? I say, you see some pictures there, right? And yeah, that look like your work? She said, no. Nice, eh? Very nice, very nice. See, I sort of shape him. Yeah, you know. She said, well, I said, well, I'll tell you what. You give me some more money, and we ain't got to do that. So she give me 25 cents an hour more. Then we get into this beef with Martin Luther King Day. You say, well, you gotta come in and say, ah, you know, going to work on that day, people be looking at me. You know what I mean? I feel funny. You say, well, if you don't come in, if you're not coming in, don't bother. Yeah, what the hell? I went home to my wife, I quit. She said, yo, what? And I started sewing in my house. I was sewing in my house, before, you know, my business took off. Good morning. Hello, how are you doing? Come in. I had known about his hats. I don't remember how I'd known about his hats. Maybe I'd seen some ladies in his hats, but I didn't know where the store was. I'm walking down Seventh Avenue one day. Uh, I was walking down, jaunting along, turned my head and saw all these fantastic hats in the window. He had such great colors and such great color combinations. I 
found his shop and I went in and luckily he was there. I found him about burning his hats uh, because of Sekou Sandiata and uh, Craig Harris. They always had these hats on. I just admired their hats so much. I would always forget to ask them where they got their hats. I was uh, up in Harlem one day on Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard on 7th Avenue at 133rd round in there. I saw it across the street and I went over there, across the street, and went over and saw his place and I went in. And I said, man, are you bunny? He said, every day, you know, or something like that. And I looked around the place and I was looking at all these hats that he had. I said, damn, these hats are bad. You know, I said, um, uh, I, really like, I really like your hats. I really like your hats. I said, I'd like to have some made, a couple made. And he said, well, come back. In the meantime, my wife, Margaret, went up and uh, she went in there. We, we went in there together and uh, she saw the hat and she moved right on it to have a hat made. She had this hat, she got, got, saw the hat and had it made. And so I went back the next week and, um, and, and had him measure, measure me, uh, measure my head and do, and do these hats. It's such a, an aggressive kind of fashion statement to wear a hat, I think, uh, sort of, uh, flirty and flaunty and that sort of thing so you have to have a bit of courage I think to wear a hat. You have to dress around his hats. You, you, you can't buy a hat from Bun and wear it with a dress you have. That's what happened to me. I bought the hat, I thought I had the dress for it and it turns out the hat the dress didn't work so I had to go get another outfit. I'm not gonna buy no other suits. I like Bun. I think he's great. But I got great clothes. Bun, notwithstanding. So you know what I mean. I chose these colors because of the the colors that I have and the suits that I have and clothes that I have. So I'm not buying no other clothes. <laughs> it's just go the way you're Bun, buying. Go with Bun's hat. You know, I mean, I think he's a wonderful guy, but that's just a total ego trip. Well, I think that's a male, that's a male's attraction. Well, just, a, a woman would buy it and I'll get to go with Well, he's, because, you know, he's entitled to it. He's yeah. A, he's entitled to it. I, and I, I think he's a great artist. Well, I just had to get that on camera, but... <laughs> <laughs> you ain't gonna make me spend a fortune. You can go with your hat. <laughs> I never look at my hats as accessories. When you buy my piece, you go get an outfit to go with it. So the hat is the piece. You're not using my hats to accessorize. And people know that. They come here to get the hat first. Then they go find something to wear. They build around the hat. Hat makers consider their work accessories. I put too much energy into what I do. to get this hat there's a story you know this hat was really made for someone else and I told Bun I said no 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 I can't take someone else's hat and by the way it doesn't even fit he says well I can stretch it for you and that's the kind of person he was he was an artist that that living in the moment with understanding and trying to be a, 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 an inspiration to others and, and, and move things along in the stratosphere. I particularly thought that this allowed me one chance in life to look like Marcus Garvey. They make me feel uh, powerful. They make me feel fashion forward, they lift my spirits. They make me feel adventurous. Now this hat, Bond wanted to try something different. It was a, a very tiny, tiny brim with the same kind of crown. I left it in a dressing room in Atlanta. That hat went the way of thievery. Dwight mailed it to me uh, by way of UPS and someone stole the UPS uh, sticker off my door and went and claimed my hat. I wonder what they thought of that. Uh, so that hat fortunately was captured in a great 
Lawrence Sercheff is the photographer, yeah. Um, and then, um... Let me show you another one. myself wearing this one quite a bit. Sometimes I wear the brim up and sometimes I wear the brim down. What's <laughs> it? Um, does the hat ever inspire you to play? Uh, actually, there is one that did one second. I remember we were doing a concert and uh, Cecil and Yamashita and I, and at one point I played the hat. And so I have to say that the hat inspired me to play it. Cecil, he's definitely one who would comment on distinctive hats and mirth. Yeah, I know, John. Basquiat. I met him when the Mud Club opened. The night it opened. That's when I met him. He's always begging for a quarter to use the dryer. And one day it occurred to me, why? You can go down by Canal G, buy them final shirts, and use a certain kind of pen to draw on the white shirts, and then throw them in the dryer, so they fade into the fabric. And I hustle them right out there. I brought them to Brooklyn to do a couple of sketches for a flyer. We were going to pop some parties in Brooklyn. He did one. I should have get him to sign it. I might have made some money today. <laughs> I saw him about a couple of days before he passed, man. I saw him on Barry there by 3rd Street because he was living right around the corner. That was just really the, the village, you know, with art and culture, and, you know, craft and everything else. Writers, to painters, to musicians, to you know, playwrights, everybody hung out on the Lower East Side because it was non-commercial. That was the mecca for that. It got a bad rep all the way around because of the drug situation. But all in all, I mean, the Lower East Side, that was my spot.